My name is Talia, again, um, I'm a current master's student at the University of Arizona uh, in the School of Geography and Development, um, and I'm taking a nine-month break from that to be here, which I'm really excited about, um, and so today I'll tell you a little bit about what I'll be doing down here, um, and it's looking at how tree rings can enhance our understanding of climate change and also fluctuations in water resource availability in the Altiplano Plateau. Um, also, I realized my date is wrong, so that's okay, too. <laughs> um, but if you aren't familiar, I wanted to start by showing you kind of where the Altiplano is, what it looks like. Um, so this map here is a map of different um, ecosystems throughout the Central Andes. So you can see here I'm most interested in looking at the dry puna, which is um, marked by the vertical striping, which is a little challenging to see. But basically in the dry puna stands the Altiplano, which is one of the highest elevation um, semi-arid plateaus in the world. And so you can see that the conditions for uh, plant life are quite harsh. Uh, not a lot grows up there. Um, uh, rainfall comes during one season of the year, typically in the summer, um, and then daily fluctuations in temperature are huge. And so that makes it really challenging for plants to survive. Um, but despite this pretty barren landscape and arid climate, um, the Altiplano is interspersed with these exceptionally green, uh, high elevation wetlands, uh, which are locally known as bofedales. Um, and so these are a really critical source of water throughout the year. Uh, they stay green, um, and so their benefits are many, um, some of which are listed here. They provide habitat for a number of mammal and bird species, some of which that are endangered. Um, they provide agriculture and uh, industrial water supply. Um, and also a water supply for drinking water. Um, and then really importantly, they uh, provide a landscape for grazing for local, not, well, for uh, llamas and alpacas of the local communities, um, which is a major like basis of their uh, economy. And so you can see there's also tourism, carbon sequestration, among other things, but the benefits are environmental, social, and economic. Um, and so, um, because these uh, bofedales are at kind of this elevational threshold for plant life, um, they're uh, really susceptible to changes in climate and also human use and activity. And so um, over the past 50 years, uh, the Altiplano region has experienced an increase in temperature and also, um, as Kate has been nicely introduced, a, a reduction um, or a retreat in glaciers, um, and then those trends are expected to continue uh, into the future, and then in addition to that, decreases in precipitation and rainfall, and then also a decrease in runoff and a change in the seasonality of when that runoff is coming, and so that's also um, in part largely fed by glaciers. Um, and so in in some, like the, these um, projections for the Altiplano region suggest that it is likely to become much more uh, like threatened in the coming century. Um, and in addition to changes in climate, there have been population increases and um, the development of large-scale mining projects, which are highly contested and often water-intensive, and so um, that is also contributing to new vulnerabilities. Um, and so with that, my goal is to understand how these wetlands, the Bofedales, have changed over time. Um, like, are they shrinking? What What is their trajectory look like? And also to establish an, uh, a foundation to be able to detect and attribute cha uh, changes that are occurring today and ones that might occur in a more uncertain future. Um, and so with that question in mind, we can learn a lot about um, bofedales from satellite imagery. Uh, we can use a measure called NDVI, which stands for Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which is a fancy way for basically just saying how green something is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if and it's NDVI is useful because it can tell us about how um, 
how effectively plants are like capturing and using energy from the sun during photosynthesis and how actively they're storing releasing carbon. Um, and so for example, if you look in the Amazon rainforest where there's tons of green, there's a really high NDVI, lots of plant activity going on there. Whereas if you look at where I'm coming from in Arizona, the sandy desert, not as high of an NDVI just because there's not as much plant life, not as much carbon storage, that kind of a thing. Um, and so the Bofidales are really unique in that we can separate them from the rest of their landscape because they're so exceptionally green. So the idea is that we're able to extract kind of where they are, what they look like in the images, and look at how they've been changing over time. Um, and so the imagery from satellites is amazing, um, but it only extends back until about 1980, um, which is really not a long enough time frame to um, understand how uh, whether or not changes we're seeing today are unprecedented or and as a result of human-induced climate change or whether or not we've seen conditions like this in the past. And so that is where uh, dendrochronology or the study of tree rings through time comes in. Um, so trees are really excellent storytellers and recorders of climate. They basically have a book um, on the ins inside, underneath their bike bark. Um, and so uh, trees like Polylepis, um, Kenyoa, lives in the Altiplano and can live up to 700 years old, or beyond 700 years old, so that could dramatically extend our understanding of like the wetlands, and you might be a little confused right now about how I've just jumped from satellites to tree rings, and so I'm going to break that down a little bit and show you how tree rings can really inform our understanding of wetland productivity and greenness. Um, so this is a little cartoon of a cross section of a tree. So you can see the bark is up here and the pith or the center of the tree is down in the middle. Um, each ring consists of an early wood which forms as the tree is starting to grow in the spring and the late wood which is more dense wood that uh, forms as it's kind of shutting down to become dormant in the winter. And so um, each annual ring consists of the early wood and late wood, and the width of that can tell us a lot about the climate of that, of that year. Um, so wide rings, like these two, um, mean that the growing conditions were really good, the trees had lots of water, um, whereas these thinner rings uh, were growing in much harsher conditions, there wasn't as much water, they weren't as happy that year. And so we can count backwards to establish this long-term record of growth and what the climate was like in every year. So for example, if this was 2017, we can say, okay, that means 2016 had more water than 2017, and 2015, that was not a good year for that tree and that environment. Um, and so, because uh, these Kenyoa trees are growing really close to the Bofidales and are receiving inputs from the same types of water, uh, like rainfall, we would assume that in a year where the tree ring is really big, that the Bofidal was exceptionally green and active and, um, and photosynthesizing a lot, whereas um, a smaller ring would indicate that the Bofidal was the past. And so, um, we can use, so with the tree rings, then we have a much longer record. We can use living trees, samples from living trees, archaeological wood, if that's available, um, and then also just dead wood lying around that doesn't look very spectacular, but often is really old, um, as long as parts of their lifespans overlap. So you can see that, um, like the live trees, brings us to present, and then this archaeological and dead wood can extend it back. This is a random example, but it just shows, you know, they went back to 1640. And so um, tree rings with uh, wide tree rings show us periods of high growth, whereas the smaller tree rings show us periods of low growth. Um, and yeah, and so the idea then is that we can use um, the tree rings uh, to extend and reconstruct the records of NDVI um, far beyond the instrumental records, so far beyond 1980-ish, um, and then use that as a foundation to detect and attribute um, the changes and to place the severity of current and future shifts in context. Um, and also another cool thing about this is we can look at our uh, reoccurrences of drought and wet periods, uh, which can be really important um, for developing water resource management plans. So for example, 
this is just a random example, if there was a drought, a two-year drought every 20 years that we could look at in this record, that is something that we could plan for in management. Um, and so lastly, I think it's important to note that this is part of a much larger effort and project led by Dr. Duncan Christie at the Universidad Austral in Valdivia. Um, and so he is specifically interested in looking at climate and water resource changes in the Altiplano over the last thousands of year, thousand years. Um, and so Dr. Christie and other um, collaborators will be looking de at developing records of things like glacier mass balance, um, gain, which is the gain and loss of ice each year, uh, lake levels and precipitation, and then my little the part I'm covering that, which is related to the NDVI and the Bofedales. And so I also hope to work with CONAF and um, because they have developed a, a conservation program for wetlands. Um, and then uh, also uh, other places like the Center for Climate and Resilience Research to begin to share the research with a wider audience and to inform management decisions. Chile. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we need to talk a lot. Okay. <laughs> I, I really like your presentation. Thank you. Actually, I am working on Bofedales in Northern Chile. Cool. Uh, uh, and most of my research questions are very similar to, to your research questions. Uh -huh. And I'm using many of your methods. Oh, cool. We have archaeological wood in our research. Oh, so, yeah. That's good to know. <laughs> I have a lot of questions or oh, no. comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First, we need, you need to problematize the concept of bofedales. Bofedales are not wetlands. Okay. Uh, so we need to talk okay. about that. Then, bofedales are not affected by population. And here it's very important to consider that bofedales are not natural. Yeah. And one of the things that we have discovered in our research is that bofedales are actually produced by local population. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so bofedales are irrigated. Mm -hmm. They are just only few bofedales that exist by, mm -hmm. by, by themselves. Right. So this is very co counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. A lot of research has shown that population has have migrated yeah due to climate change, mm -hmm. because climate change has been affected by bofedales, and bofedales are disappearing because yes. of climate change. Yeah. And in our research, we have shown how people, how bofedales are disappearing because of people have been migrating and they are not irrigating the bofedales yeah. anymore. And that's completely uh, counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. But now, one important thing is, uh, the problem of the of NDVI. Mm -hmm. It's very problematic for understanding bofedales. Mm -hmm. And why? Because in the bofedales, you have many types of vegetation. Yeah. You have peat yeah. and you have festuca. Yeah. And the problem with festuca is that when you see festuca through the satellite images, mm -hmm. the NDVI show you uh, if they are uh, show you um, the festuca. Mm -hmm. And festuca can be considered as invasive species mm -hmm. within the bofedal. Mm -hmm. So, when you use NDVI, mm -hmm. um, the images can show you a very healthy bofedal yeah. that actually is not yeah. healthy. Mm -hmm. It's a bofedal that is disappearing. Yeah. Because festuca is, is well adapted to yeah. uh, climate change and is well adapted to uh, arid conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think, so this is just like the preliminary, you know, yeah. design of the project, and yeah, so the Bofidales I know are really, um, like, influenced by the way that people divert and manage them, um, and then also I know there are other measures, like the, uh, so they're kind of just, becoming more popular to use the solar-induced fluorescence mm -hmm. and some other satellite measures that are definitely of interest to consider as maybe better than NDVI. Because I know there have been um, some problems with NDVI and people like remote sensors are questioning whether it's mm -hmm. a, the best measure or whether things, other measures are better to use. So that's, yeah, definitely in my brain. Yeah, <laughs> would, you able, would you be able to come to lunch today? Uh, what time's that? Lunch will be just at like 1.30.
I'm or gonna try to because I have I have to <laughs> go back. Well, so I need to catch a fly. Well, if not, so if you guys wanted like. Uh, you know, excuse yourselves for a minute and go. Speak. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just you know, contact because this, yeah. this is well, what this presentation. Yeah, about. so I got my PhD here at the, at the UAA, so we have like professors yeah. oh. in common. And yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. ah, you guys feel the magic? I feel like <laughs> <laughs> Chills. Do <laughs> anybody has like uh, other questions before we continue? I have a question. Yeah. I'm also involved in this project. Yeah. So I'm very interested in yeah. this also yeah. learning. Um, <laughs> but this is actually not related specifically to that. I mm -hmm. was wondering, like, when you're looking at trees that have already died, mm -hmm. um, how difficult or like how likely is it that the tree could have moved from its original location or how do you go about sort That's of like question. potentially locating it? Or that might be something that you'll, yeah. you'll find out once yeah. you Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how likely it is that they move unless somebody were to move it, right? Mm -hmm. Or if yeah. there was like a like a avalanche or something like that. Right. Um, but in general, um, if it doesn't, I mean, if it's not moving like miles for this kind of study, it's not uh, super critical because all those trees that are in this region are going to be receiving the same um, inputs of water. So like mm -hmm. it's going to be responding to the same uh, signals of rainfall and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you again. Thanks.